Good morning, everyone. So let's get started. So as you know, we have a set of lectures. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, David tell us about his first functionals. Let me just remind everyone that if you ask questions, either use the microphone or speak loudly because it's being recorded. So thanks a lot, David. OK, thank you. It's really nice to be here at 2 in the morning. <laughs> um, I was originally uh, thinking that these lectures were sort of going to be in the spirit of like a bootstrap school, so uh, so very pedagogical and, and targeted at um, uh, people who are new to this subject. And um, I, I asked Leonardo about this, and he, he said, no, don't do that, and encouraged me to make them, quote, hard. <laughs> um, so I'm not really sure what pace to go at, and uh, my plan for today um, uh, is, uh, well, it doesn't look like it's going very far to me, but I'm, I'm not really sure. So I'd like lots of feedback from the audience. Um, please ask questions, and you'll help me calibrate the speed of these lectures, and that'll help me decide what to cover um, next time. Okay. So, all right. So dispersive functionals. So um, uh, we're going to be interested in four-point functions in a d-dimensional CFT. And for the most part, I'm interested in d bigger than two dimensions. So I'll, I'll basically assume that for these lectures. And um, this four-point function, of course, by conformal invariance, can be written as a function of the cross ratios, fancy g of u and e. And I'm going to use slightly unconventional conventions here, where I divide by x1, 3, through 2 delta phi, x2, 4 to the 2 delta phi. Um, and the advantage of these conventions is that the statement of crossing symmetry between the s and t channels uh, is very simple. It's just that g of u comma v is g of v comma u. And um, so this, is, this is st crossing symmetry. And um, uh, so I should just say what I mean by s and t. So the s channel is uh, in my convention, it's going to be 1, 2 goes to 3, 4. The T channel is 1, 4 goes to 2, 3. And the U channel is 1, 3 goes to 2, 4. And it's unfortunately necessary to set, all of these, uh, set out all these conventions because we're, we're going to be talking about all three channels will play a role. Um, OK. So, uh, good. So, so um, OK. So in these conventions, uh, this function of U and V, has a conformal block decomposition, which I'll write like this. It's a sum over delta nj of some positive coefficients, p delta j, times s channel conformal blocks. And the cost of this uh, slightly different convention is that the s channel conformal blocks um, depend on delta phi in these conventions. So in particular, um, I'll normalize these so that at small z and z bar, they look like zz bar to the minus delta phi. So there's the delta phi dependence times z to the delta minus j over 2, z bar to the delta plus j over 2. And this is in the limit that z is much, much less than z bar, which is much, much less than 1. Okay? So this suffices to normalize the, uh, the conformal law. OK. Um, so in the, in the usual bootstrap logic, we consider linear functionals acting on the four-point function. So they take the four-point function to, um, to some real number. Um, and uh, it will be convenient to take our linear functionals to be crossing into symmetric. So usually we talk about acting on the crossing equation, but instead I want the functional to act on the four-point function. And to get a sum rule, we want the functional itself to be crossing into symmetric. So what that means is that if you act with omega on some function of z and z bar, then this is minus omega acting on the cross function. Here I'm abusing notation because, of course, when we act with omega on the function, then we don't have any z, z bar dependence left over. So for example, the, the functional might be evaluating this at some point. So here what I mean is the function of z and z bar, and here I mean the cross function, but the left-hand side doesn't actually depend on z and z bar. Okay, hopefully that abuse of notation is, is uh, not too confusing. So if we take our functional to be crossing anti-symmetric, then because g is crossing symmetric, we get uh, the statement that omega acting on g is zero. Um, and uh, if omega is sufficiently nice, and here I'll use the term swappable, 
Um, so if omega is swappable in that it can be swapped with the infinite sum uh, here, um, then we can exchange uh, omega with the sum, and we get a sum over. Sum over delta nj, p delta j, omega acting on an S channel block is zero. Um, and this swappability condition uh, will be important. So we'll encounter functionals that naively look okay, but are not swappable. And we'll have to pay attention to the conditions that make it swappable. Um, okay, but I'll, I'll give more detail about that later. Okay, so this is the usual uh, bootstrap logic. And so now we're ready for a definition of what a dispersive function is. So a dispersive functional um, is a functional that has double zeros on um, all but a finite number of double twist families. So what that means is that um, if we act with the functional on double twist conformal blocks, so those are conformal blocks where delta is 2 delta phi plus 2n plus j. Um, with spin j, um, then this is zero <coughs> for all n bigger than some n star. And actually, we also want a condition that the functional should have double zeros on uh, double twist blocks. So that means we, we also want to impose that omega is zero when acting on the derivative of the block with respect to delta at a double twist location. N star depends on J, or should it not depend on J? Uh, N star um, uh, sh should, well, it, it can depend on J, but you should imagine that it, it doesn't. Um, it, it's more useful notation to imagine N star not depending on J. Okay, so we also have this condition, um, also for N bigger than N star. Okay? So, um, all right, so I, I will refer to both of these kinds of functions collectively as double twist blocks. So when I say double twist blocks, I mean both blocks evaluated at the double twist location and also the derivatives with respect to delta. Um, and the significance of these objects is that the, the double twist blocks represent the contributions from uh, tree level contact interactions in ADS. So if we have a, a, a tree level contact Witten diagram, it can be de decomposed into double twist blocks. Um, and so one of the nice things about dispersive functionals is they let you cleanly separate out um, the contributions of those contact Witten diagrams from other contributions, for example, in holographic theories. Um, okay, so, so, so this, is the, this is the definition. Um, and so uh, what, why should we be interested in, in these? So I want to talk about motivation for thinking about them. So we'll have uh, three sort of interrelated motivations for thinking about these kinds of functionals. Um, so the first one is that um, extremal functionals for some simple uh, bootstrap problems, bootstrap bounds, Um, are dispersive. Um, and this is something that, that was initially um, initially noticed experimentally by just doing numerics and observing that the extremal functional appeared to be a dispersive function. Um, so as an example, um, we could consider uh, maybe the first bootstrap computation ever done. The first one doesn't give a dispersive functional, but the, but the, second, the second one that you might try does. Um, so let me define delta L as the lowest dimension um, of a spin L operator in the phi phi OBE. So we can put an upper bound on delta L as a, as a function of delta phi. Um, and maybe the most famous one uh, let's say we plot delta 0 versus delta phi 
in, say, 3D. So just to orient you, this is the plot that has the, the famous kink, uh, the famous icing kink. Okay? So this one is, is very interesting, um, and it would be really nice if we knew the extremal functional for this plot, um, if we had some analytic expression for it, but we don't currently. Um, and um, uh, that problem is probably much more challenging than the problems that we'll talk about in, in these lectures. And one reason is that um, the extremal functional at this point uh, contains in it at least a good approximation to the spectrum of the 3D icing model. And um, we don't really know how to build uh, a functional um, with those properties analytically. Um, but uh, if you instead make a plot of delta 2 um, or delta L for, for any L bigger than 0, versus delta phi, um, this plot is much simpler. Um, what, what happens is that um, if you make this plot numerically, you get some set of upper bounds, and as you increase the number of derivatives, the upper bounds start to converge, and <coughs> they appear to be converging towards um, the mean field theory line. Delta 2 is um, 2 delta phi plus 2. Um, okay, so, so the, the upper bound on delta 2 is converging towards mean field theory. That means that um, if, if the extremal functional, uh, that means that if the bound truly is, is, uh, agrees with mean field theory, um, then the extremal functional has to have zeros on the mean field theory spectrum. Um, and furthermore, by positivity, most of these have to be double zeros. Okay? So, um, uh, let's suppose that the, the bound really is the mean field theory line, then what would the extremal functional have to look like in this case? So we can plot omega, actually let me give, this, give it a name in this case. I'll say phi 2 is the extremal functional for the spin 2 gap problem, so we'll call this the spin L gap problem, and now we're interested in the spin 2 gap problem. So if we can look at phi 2 acting on a conformal block, and we can ask about this as a function of delta for a different j. <coughs> um, and uh, the idea is that um, uh, uh, what, what, what can this look like? So for example, when j equals 0, um, this has to be some positive function. Um, and it has, to be, it has to have double zeros uh, on the mean field theory spectrum. 2 delta phi plus 2n. They have to be double zeros by positivity. Um, and sorry, this is supposed to be j equals two, or j equals zero. Um, and then meanwhile, for j, and, and, and similarly for for four and six and so on. So anything for j not equal to two, we should have this structure. Um, and when j equals two, we have zeros on almost all the mean field theory operators, except the double zeros on almost all of them. But we can have a single zero at the first one. Okay, so here we have a single zero at delta equals 2 delta phi uh, plus 2, and then double zeros, for example, at 2 delta phi plus 4, and so on. Where's the unit operator in this? Good, so, so furthermore, we should have a zero on the unit operator. So also, phi 2 of g, 0, 0, should be zero. And the unit operator is to the left. And we can have negativity in between uh, the unitarity bound and the unit operator. That's OK. So I'm, I'm just not writing that on the plot. But uh, thank you for that comment. OK? So Any questions about this? So the, the n starts goes with j, like just with a linear linear way in this case. Good. So, so, so in this case, um, uh, um, n star um, is 1. So n is measuring, is measuring uh, this direction, right? It's measuring the delta direction. Um, and the idea is that um, the, uh, this, this uh, operator here is an n equals 0 operator, right? This is 2 delta phi plus 2 times 0 plus j. Um, so this is an n equals 0 operator where there isn't a double 0. 
And for all the n equals 1 and higher operators, there is a double zero. So, that, so this is an example of, of n star equals, uh, I guess n star equals zero Yeah, in, in my notation there. So here, so here n star equals zero. So n star labels the highest double twist family on which the, the functional um, has support. So I'll say it has support if it does not have a double zero there. Yes. And are, are you also saying all of the zeros of this form? Or just there are zeros of this form, but there might be additional. Ah, that's an excellent question. So there certainly could be other zeros. Um, they also have to be double zeros, but they don't necessarily have to be at the uh, the double twist locations. Um, and in fact, um, so one of the things that that I'll try to describe in these lectures is how one constructs a functional with these properties. And in that construction, you have no control over whether where the other zeros of the functional potentially are. Um, Generically, it probably doesn't have others, but it, but it might. Um, Did you say that the, if it has other <coughs> zeros, it all, they also have to be double zeros? They do, yeah, that, that's right. That's right. So generically, you wouldn't expect them to be there. Sort of depends on, I guess it depends on your construction. Um, so in practice, the, the way we construct this, uh, this phi 2 is by um, uh, building in the double zeros on the mean field theory spectrum and then checking positivity by hand. So we, I don't, we don't know a way of building in positivity. Um, so, uh, um, so you build in the double zeros, and then you have to check positivity. So it, that, that check could have failed. One way it could have failed is just by the functional being negative somewhere. Another way it could have failed was by the functional <coughs> having an extra double zero somewhere. That's obviously a less generic case. So the generic case would be that it's either positive or it's negative somewhere. <coughs> Other questions? But you did not include positivity condition in the definition of dispersive function. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. So we'll be, uh, I'll be constructing dispersive functions <coughs> at first without any question about positivity, and then positivity is something that you have to achieve later by taking appropriate linear combinations. Other questions? Good. So, um, okay. So, so this this fact that the bound appears to be converging towards mean field theory um, was observed experimentally, um, and you can also make these plots and um, observe that the extremal functional does does indeed seem to be converging towards something with these properties. Um, that convergence happens more slowly at large delta. Um, so, if you look at small delta, you can indeed see these double zeros, and as you increase the number of of derivatives you sort of get more and more double zeros, um, uh, and the double zeros get, are at locations that are getting closer and closer to the main field. Okay? Um, good. So, we like to just uh, construct dispersive functionals so that we can um, maybe try to get a handle on the extremal functional for this simple bootstrap problem. And you could maybe think of that as a warm-up for thinking about the extremal functional for this problem, but I don't have much more to say about that. Um, in these, in these lectures. Okay, so um, motivation number two um, <clears throat> motivation number two is the light from bootstrap. Um, so, so one formulation of the Lake Cone bootstrap is, is via the Lorentzian inversion formula. So that uh, has the following form. So there's an integral against the double discontinuity of the four-point function in some measure. So there's this, let's see, there's this funny conformal block that depends on j and delta. And then D disk, let's say in the T channel. Okay, so there's a formula like this, um, and uh, the function on the left hand side encodes the spectrum of operators as poles. So this thing has poles, um, where the uh, residue of the poles are the um, uh, conformal block coefficients, and the position of the poles are at the locations of the operators. 
So, um, in one approach to the light cone bootstrap, um, what you do is you try to describe the pole associated to a low twist operator on the left hand side by plugging in the T channel lock decomposition on the right hand side. So, you, you try to get some expression that relates the pole on the left hand side to a sum over T channel blocks on the right hand side. Um, and um, there's, there's uh, um, a basic issue with trying to do this, um, which is that the, uh, the Lorenzian inversion formula is defined initially for delta on the principal series. So that's for uh, complex delta on this line. And if you want to focus on the physics of a particular pole, you need to continue away from the principal series. So you can start with this formula, and then try to analytically continue it away from the principal series. Um, but there's a problem, which is that if you plug in here the T-channel conformal block decomposition, so let's say sum over delta prime, J prime, P delta prime, J prime of T-channel blocks, like this, um, if you plug this in, then this analytic continuation away from the principal series does not commute with the infinite sum over conformal blocks. So um, what you get, it, what that means is that you have to do the sum over conformal blocks first before you analytically continue. And so, for example, if you try to pick out, say, the contribution of a, of a pole, let's say the pole for the lowest twist operator at some spin, then you get some expression that looks like P delta I J is equal to some limit of the sum over T channel blocks. So just very roughly it has this structure. And this is this is a general thing that you get that, that you'll get out of the Lorentzian inversion formula due to the fact that the analytic continuation, which is associated with this limit. So the limit means you start on the principal series and you move towards the pole, doesn't commute, commute with this sum. And this this is a generic structure that also uh, appears, for example, in the, the uh, bootstrap-based proof of the ANIC. So the idea of the ANIC is it's basically exactly this idea. In the ANIC, you want to focus on the ANIC operator on the left-hand side and relate it to some sum on the right-hand side. Um, the ANIC operator is a particular operator. To focus on its contribution, you have to take some kind of limit. Um, that limit does not commute with the sum uh, on, on the right-hand side, so you necessarily end up with this kind of structure. And then the ANIC argument, you argue that this sum is positive, um, and so the limit is positive. Um, but you cannot swap the sum and the limit. Um, and so the, the same thing is true in the Lorentzian inversion formula, and, and the, the, this, this is a, a basic problem with, um, with a basic issue that you encounter in the light cone bootstrap. So one way to get around this issue is to say, okay, we're interested in asymptotic expansions at large spin, so you take this to be large, and then you can try to argue that if you're, if you're computing the asymptotic expansion, you can swap them, okay? Um, but uh, basically, um, another point of view on this is that um, uh, in, in trying to swap the sum and the limit, we, we're, we have too much hubris, and of course we should always go back to just the basic bootstrap argument, which is using functionals. So, um, uh, what, what is the perspective of dispersive functionals on this, uh, on this problem? Well. The idea is that if you if you have a functional and it's a swappable functional, then um, then this swappable functional gives you true sum rules. Um, and so, using dispersive functionals, you can get sum rules that are almost like this, but a little bit different. So the idea is that um, you can get sum rules that say that uh, p delta i comma j plus something that is hopefully small is equal to a true sum over the other channel. Okay, So the limit is gone, but the price that you pay is that there's an extra junk in your sum rule, and you have to control that, that extra junk. And this you get from, from the inversion formula or from the correction equation? Here? So this, this is something that would fall, that comes from a dispersive function, uh, dispersive sum rule. So. so you don't need, if you speak of inversion formula to derive it. Um, that's, that's right, although the dispersive functional that gives rise to this is very closely related to the inversion formula. <coughs> um, uh, um, that's right. Do you need to know delta i exactly for it to write down something? 
Yeah, you, you don't. You, you, you don't. So, so, so the idea is that this, this step is small if the operator is close to the mean field theory um, value. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the rough idea. Um, but uh, how controllable this stuff is, is really, it's really a theory dependent thing. Um, you could have some crazy theory with a whole bunch of operators near the mean field theory value, and then this somewhere would not be very useful. So, um, so the third motivation, um, motivation number three, um, is holographic CFTs. Um, and um, this is what uh, I'm, I'm planning to spend the second half of these lectures on. So I'm going to hopefully uh, spend, spend a lot of time on the holographic case. Um, and uh, the key idea is that dispersive functionals let you lift flat space dispersive sum rules to CFT. Okay, so if you have a dispersive sum rule in flat space, you can lift it by applying a dictionary where you take a you take your flat space dispersion relation and you make a replacement where you replace it with a CFT dispersive functional. Um, and it gives you a sum rule that applies to holographic CFTs that encodes the same physics as the flat space sum rule in an appropriate flat space limit. Okay? So why might you want to do this? Well, the nice thing is that in the setting of CFT, if you have a functional, then uh, you, can, you can be really confident you know what you're doing. Um, because we know a lot about the structure of CFT correlation functions. Um, and so you could, for example, check positivity of the, of the functional and be confident that your sum rule is correct. Um, uh, whereas, um, uh, uh, and this, this, can, um, uh, th this, is, this is very nice. Of course, in, in flat space, we think we know the correct axioms that go into writing down flat space dispersion relations, but the ability to translate them into a setting that's completely rigorous is, is, is non-trivial and, and very nice. Um, and a consequence of this is that you can use flat space technology to get bounds on ADS Wilson coefficients. Okay, and the this the the um, simple summary of these bounds is that they agree with flat space. Um, the actual story is a bit more complicated, and, and hopefully we'll have time to discuss those complications uh, in these lectures, but I don't know how much of the time. And ADS yeah. Wilson coefficient is just some CFT data. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So these bounds on ADS Wilson coefficients, what I, what I mean is that they're, they're bounds on the CFT four-point function, <coughs> that um, if, you phrase, if you parameterize the four-point function um, as a sum of Witten diagrams, um, uh, if you parameterize the... the um, the low energy data of the four point function in terms of the sum of Witten diagrams. So I mean, by low energy data, I mean, for example, anomalous dimensions and OP coefficients of double twist operators at, at low dimension, um, so, or at low twist. So, so of course, that's some CFT data. You can parameterize it in terms of Witten diagrams. So you can write it formally as a sum over Witten diagrams. And then the idea is that in that sum over Witten diagrams, there are bounds on the coefficients. Okay? So those bounds can be translated into bounds on CFT anomalous dimensions and three-point coefficients, if you like. But they're most easily phrased in terms of this parameterization in terms of Witten diagrams. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right. And don't forget to tell me if I'm going too fast or too slow. Okay, because I need I need your input to help uh, calibrate the speed of these uh, of these lectures. Okay, so hopefully I'll get uh, I'll be able to describe this in much more detail. Uh, I hope we have time. So I'm not I'm not going to give much more detail now. And let's let's jump in. So I'll I'll talk about two different constructions of of dispersive functionals um, that will end up being the same. Um, and the first one is in position space, and the second one is in Mellon space. And so today I'll probably only have time to talk about position space. At least I hope that's the case, because I don't have anything about Mellon space in the notes there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, 
So, so we're going to talk about uh, a construction of dispersive functionals um, from position space. Um, and so the basic mechanism for getting these double zeros is via the double commutator or D-disk. Okay. So let me remind you a little bit um, uh, about, about the D-disk. Um, so, uh, um, so, so the idea of the D-disk is that the D-disk of G, um, uh, let's say in the S channel, um, is essentially the, the double commutator inside the four-point function. So if we stick in our dimensional full factors, this is equal to the four-point function in Lorentzian signature, where um, we study this double commutator. And here I'm using this shorthand notation that I'll probably use several times, where phi sub i is phi of x sub i. Okay, so so let me remind you how this how this these commutators um, give rise to the double zeros that we're interested in, um, and this is something that you can see uh, uh, just in terms of the OPE of of uh, phi one by two. So let's look at that OPE. So it's a sum over operators um, x one two squared to some factor that comes from dimensional analysis. And then we need to soak up the spin of the operator in the OPE. And that operator has spin j. So this is the contribution uh, from, from the primary operator at x2. And of course, there are contributions from descendants. Um, and uh, when 1 and 2 are space-like separated from each other, this formula is unambiguous. Um, but when they're time-like from each other, which is the uh, configuration that's relevant for evaluating this commutator, then we need to specify an i-epsilon prescription to compute this. Um, so here comes the hopefully pedagogical part of, uh, of, of these lectures. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe, um, hopefully in some detail, how this i-epsilon prescription works. It's going to be reviewed for many of you, but uh, hopefully it will, it will be helpful. Okay, so, so how does the i epsilon prescription work? And by the way, I have to do this computation every time I sit down to, to do something more complicated. I have to do this on the board for myself, so, so, so you'll see it. Okay, so, um, all right. So let's, let's write out the definition of phi of x. So this is e to the minus i p dot x, phi of 0, e to the i p x. Okay, and now I, I always have to pause and check whether the sign is correct in this one. <laughs> um, how do we check that? Well, the idea is, so I'm, I'm in mostly plus signature. So this contains a term that looks like e to the minus i h t. Okay, and that is the correct Schrodinger evolution operator in quantum mechanics um, uh, because of the minus i. So that was, that was decided um, for us in time immemorial. And um, uh, the reason it's the factor on the right-hand side that's relevant is because um, if we have other stuff in the correlator, then this thing on the right-hand side is the thing that evolves those other things. Okay? All right. So we need to check that there's an e to the minus ihd here. So that, that's how we know we got the right sign. Um, okay. So uh, good. So now, now we can, if we want to study operators in a particular ordering, let's say phi of x1, phi of x2, um, then uh, what we need to do is analytically continue their times by, by giving them small imaginary parts. So ti goes to ti minus i epsilon sub i, where the epsilons are the Euclidean times of the operators. And if we want them in this ordering, they need to be in this ordering of Euclidean time. So and in our case here, we need epsilon 1 to be bigger than epsilon 2. Okay? And so we can check this prescription using, using this expression. Um, so uh, what, what's going on? So if we look at phi of x1, phi of x2, um, this is equal to a bunch of stuff. And when we... When we make this continuation, we're inserting some extra operator between these things. So when we make this continuation, what we're inserting between the two operators is e to the minus epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 h phi of x2. Okay? So this is the thing to check. So you go from, from this formula 
and check for yourself that if you make this continuation, then you get this factor between the two operators. Okay? Um, so that's something that you have to check, and the sign is important for that. Um, and uh, so we can see that the, the reason this, this prescription is correct is because um, when we do this, because h is a positive operator, we're inserting e to the minus positive operator between the two uh, operators, and, and we're not going to encounter any bad singularities or anything. We're moving into the regime of holomorphy of the, of the correlator. Okay? Okay? So, so this is the, the check that you need to do to make sure this prescription is correct. And now that we know this prescription, this is the prescription for computing this ordering. And in the other ordering, we would have epsilon 2 bigger than epsilon 1. And now that we know the correct epsilon prescription, we can apply it here in the OPE to compute the, the different orderings and then get the commutator. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Just define double disk by saying okay, G has a certain function in Z dot bar. Yeah. I'm just going to pick up some crazy stuff and then why do you have to go through this argument to double commutator? Oh good. Um because um uh well it's useful to go back and forth between position space and cross ratio space. You're acting asking why am I not just working in cross ratio space from the beginning? Is yeah. that, that your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's useful to do both because some things are clearer in one space than another. So, for example, in position space, it would be very easy to write down this dispersive sum rule that I'm going to write down, and it'll be just obvious that it's dispersive. In cross ratio space, you, you can still check it, but um, it's a little less obvious. And in particular, you wouldn't immediately write it down. It wouldn't be the first thing you wrote down. Okay? Um, good. Um, in fact, I, I would say like, like one of the one of the themes of a lot of the a lot of the work in Lorentzian CFT is that there are many things that are clearer in position space than than the, position space makes many things clear, so it's useful to have a handle on it. Of course, you have other spaces that make other things clear, and so you really want to have a handle on all of them at the same time. Um, Okay, so, so this is our prescription for computing this order, and so uh, when we do that, so uh, when we apply this prescription, it means that x12 squared, you can check for yourself, goes to x12 squared plus i epsilon t12. And so in particular, this factor in the OPE, this fractional power, what is epsilon? Good. So here, epsilon is epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. Um, maybe I should have written it like this. In fact, there might even be a factor of 2 here. So 2 epsilon 1 epsilon, uh, two epsilon one minus epsilon 2, we can just call epsilon. Um, okay. So, uh, so this means that uh, in going from space like to time like, um, this quantity here uh, goes from positive to negative, but it passes above uh, the singularity at 0 if, uh, if say, phi 1 is in the future of phi 2. Okay? So let's consider that case. So let's, let's take t12 to be positive. Um, and so then we get a phase here. Um, so this thing becomes, if we continue to the time-like configuration, we have a positive factor. So now this is positive, so this, this whole thing is positive, times a phase, e to the i pi, delta minus j minus 2 delta pi, over 2. And this was what we needed for the ordering 5x1, 5x2. Okay. Um, and if we do the same thing for, uh, for the other ordering, then we get the opposite phase. <coughs> Um, and so, um, if we then compute the commutator, we get the difference of the two phases. And uh, it's useful to stare at this formula for a second. So we're going to observe something, um, something about this formula. So if we are computing the commutator using the OPE, then 
we get the difference between these two phases, which is 2i sine pi delta minus j minus 2 delta phi over 2. Um, we have a theta function because the commutator is only non-zero when x12 is timelike. And then this fractional power of x12. And then a whole bunch of x12 to various, a uh, whole bunch of x12s that don't really care about any of this. And then, oh. Okay? So this is our formula for the commutator using the OPE. And although we just focused on the primary term, the descendants get the same, exactly the same sign factor because their contributions just differ by integer powers of x12. Okay, so overall we have this factor. So, um, uh, good. So what does this factor mean? Um, so it gives zeros at double twist locations. Um, and um, so here's a quiz question. Um, not for Peter, don't answer this. <laughs> Where are the zeros of this thing as a function of delta? What are the zeros? The double twist locations. No. Okay, good. So let me write a formula and see if you agree. Okay, so the double twist locations are delta is 2 delta phi plus 2n plus j. Okay. Um, uh, wh where are the zeros in terms of n and j? I, I would say there's some subtlety because the 1 over x1 2 squared. Uh, can have a fold. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so so that, that's that's right. So that's the subtlety. So the point is that this thing has double zero. This thing has a zero. Um, can, that, I, can I ask you a elementary question? Please? Yeah. So you consider this case t one two positive. <laughs> right, but this new formula yeah. now is valid for both sides of t one two. Um, I I think it, uh, it may it might have an opposite sign for. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's the negative of the formula or if it's just equal when, when uh, you have the other configuration. Um, okay, so, so Slava, Slava noticed, the, noticed the, the, the tricky thing here. So there's this fact that when you have a power, um, uh, that, that um, uh, uh, you have to think about this thing in terms of a distribution. And as a distribution, this can actually have poles in the location of the power. So um, if you look at the structure of this thing as a function of the power lambda, it actually has poles at negative lambda. So they look like this. So there are poles at lambda minus n, where n is a negative integer, and they're proportional to derivatives of the delta function. Okay. So this formula naively has double zeros at, at um, all locations, like, sorry, naively has zeros, single zeros, at all double twist locations for all n because of the sign factor. But actually, this theta times a power of, of x12 secretly has poles when this thing is a negative integer. And so those poles cancel uh, the zeros when n is negative. OK? For generic delta phi, that's not a problem. Well, we're interested in this. We're, we're in, let's fix delta phi and ask about the zeros in delta. Okay. So the point is that there are zeros when delta has this form for n non-negative. And this might seem kind of pedantic at this point, but this is actually going to be important in a second. There is also the point that it's just constrained on n and not at turn plus j because you need to take into account this x12 to the new one things? Um, yeah, that's right. So um, uh, that has to be the case, um, uh, but I haven't worked it out in detail, but yeah. OK. Um, good. So uh, maybe there, it's better to just put this in words. So um, where do the zeros come from? They just come from the fact that when uh, you have a double twist operator in the OPE, then the OPE is regular. 
It's regular, so it has no discontinuity. Okay, so that's why you get zero. But if you have a double twist operator with negative n, the OPE is not regular. It has a singularity. It's meromorphic, but it's still a singularity, and it has a non-zero discontinuity. Okay. Um, so, um, all right. So if we look at the double discontinuity, then we just get two of these sign factors, one for each commutator. And then we end up with um, this formula that uh, Slava mentioned um, for the double discontinuity in, say, the S channel of G. It's just the sum over delta nj of this famous sign factor. So there's actually, there's like a factor of a half here, if I'm being careful. So we get 2 sine squared pi delta minus j minus 2 delta pi over 2 times the usual stuff in delta. So um, uh, if we want to get a sum rule that depends on d-disk, then we want a sum rule um, uh, that we want to think about how to get these commutators. Um, and the, the construction in position space is to consider integrals um, of the foreground function that can be naturally deformed to give, um, to give these commutators. OK? Um, so uh, the. Um, okay, so here's a lemma that will be useful for us in this construction. So we're, we'll think about light cone coordinates. Um, yeah? Uh, sorry for the next question. Uh, you, you were quite careful about the order of 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4, but uh, the relative order of the commutators, should I, should I be worried? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 uh, th th that's a great question. So, um, uh, I, um, uh, let's see. I think that, um, uh, I think that you should be worried, and I'll have to write down the, the, um, I'll, I'll write down the causal configuration that we're going to apply this to later, okay? And so then, then, yeah, we have to make sure that this is a sensible thing. Um, okay, so good. So the basic the, the basic piece of information that we're going to use um, is that if you uh, think about a correlator where an operator is acting on the vacuum as a function of the light cone coordinates, then it's polymorphic in some half space. Okay, so we're going to consider a correlator, um, and I'll just focus on its light cone dependence. So it's some correlator of um, a bunch of stuff and then phi of x acting on the vacuum. <coughs> and the claim um, is that this is holomorphic for the imaginary part of x plus bigger than 0. Um, and uh, the, the, the proof is, is very simple. You just plug in the formula for, you plug in this formula here, for 5x, and you observe that um, expanding it out, you get e to the i over 2 x plus p minus, plus a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter, phi of 0 omega, and then a whole bunch of other stuff in the correlator. Um, and the idea is that by continuing x plus in, so, so p minus is a positive operator because the um, energy momentum of the theory is supported inside the future null cone. So p minus is positive. Um, and this means that if we continue x plus so that its imaginary part becomes positive, then this is minus a positive operator in the exponent. So the, the correlator is holomorphic in that, in that machine. Okay, so it's the same argument as we were talking about over there. Um, you keep all the rest in Minkowski, right? Exactly, keeping all the rest in Minkowski. So that's, that's important. So if we had additional factors of e to the positive number times p plus somewhere else in the correlator, then those would, those would matter. Um, but uh, um, but if, we, if everything else stays in Minkowski space and we continue this into the upper half plane, then we get exponential damping from this factor. Okay? Um, good. Okay, so a consequence 
consequence of this lemma is that null integrals kill the vacuum. So this is probably the same as you've seen before. So if we take a, a null integral, let's say integral over x plus, of um, some stuff, and then 5x acting on the vacuum, this is 0 as long as the endpoints of the integral behave sufficiently nicely. So the idea is that if the integral is convergent at the endpoints, then because of holomorphy in the upper half plane, you can deform the contour into the upper half plane um, and just get 0. Okay? Um, and, and then this gives us a nice way to write down integrals that give commutators. So the idea for getting a commutator is to consider a null integral where your operator doesn't act on the vacuum, but is, is sandwiched between other operators. So as an example, if you had something like this, some insertions, and then 5x1, and we do the null integral over x1 plus, and then 5x2, and then the vacuum. Um, so we can then subtract the other ordering, which is the one where 5x1 acts on the vacuum. We can do that for free, because it's 0 by this result. We can subtract 0 for free. And that replaces this with a commutator. So this is equal to the same null integral of the commutator. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's also useful to, to visualize what this looks like in terms of the, the x1 plus plane. Okay? So what's going on in that plane? Well, we have an integral. Um, we have an integral from uh, minus infinity to infinity. Um, because of the presence of 5x2, this, uh, is, the integrand is not holomorphic in the upper half plane. But instead, there's a singularity um, associated with x1 becoming lightweight from x2. So I'll, I'll put a 2 here um, to show that that's the location where x1 becomes light like from x2. Um, and um, uh, um, let's suppose that x1 is space like from x2 over here and time like from x2 over here. So when x1 is space like from x2, then, then uh, things are holomorphic going into the upper half plane. So we have a clear path moving into the upper half plane here. But over here we don't. And the idea is that we can take this contour and we can deform it to wrap around the branch cut at 2. So we can deform it to look like this. Um, and uh, this is then the discontinuity across the branch cut, which is the commutator. Okay? So this deformed contour is the commutator. And this is just the exact same argument that I just gave, except uh, just slightly more visual in terms of contours. Okay? I so, don't understand, because there you have you put the commutator in the last equation before you start to turn picture. But the integral of the commutator is still over minus infinity to infinity. Ah, that's well, because the commutator vanishes not. over here. So you can, yeah, that, that's right. So you can, you can either write it like this, or you can write the integral as going from, let's say, that, let's say this is, this is some x star uh, to infinity. Either way, it's still correct. But you still seem to be getting only half of the integral below. Because below you say you, you take a contour which goes all the way around. Yeah. So what you get is ah, the, okay, the integral from here yeah, to infinity yeah, yeah. of the discontinuity. Okay, thank which you. Which is yeah. what this is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I, I still understand. So you, you wrap this contour around. The, yes. But uh, I'm sure that when you... Okay, so when you go to the positive imaginary side, it's... This is a zero. So yeah, so holomorphy yeah, out exactly. here is follows from, from yeah, exactly. this argument. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's the key thing that we're using. Yeah, okay. You don't have to say anything about the correlator decaying fast enough at large x plus? So you do. So you have to worry about whether the correlator decays um, fast enough. And that's something that you have to check in, in. We have to be more precise about what we're integrating before we check that. But that's something that we're going to do hopefully shortly. Okay? Um, good. Yeah. I thought the, the point of this home period here is that you have these two orderings, and you can think of the two orderings that you're subtracting as one is the, the contour right below the cut, and the other is right above the cut. Exactly. You don't even have to deform the contour. So when you take the difference, you see. Yeah, absolutely. So that's another way of phrasing what we did. So, so what, we, what we did is we took this contour, and we subtracted the zero contour, which is the contour above the cut. Yeah. 
And then over here, they just cancel, and here they give the discontinuity. Okay, so that, that's maybe a better, that's, a, that's exactly this. Um, so that's, that's a good way to think about this definition. Okay. Um, okay, very good. So these null integrals are a very general way to get integrals of commutators. And we'd like to apply this um, twice to get a double commutator. Um, but uh, now we, we don't only want a double commutator, we want to start with a sum rule. We want to start with zero equals something and apply this construction to that. Okay? So, so we're, we're ready to see the, the, the basic idea, um, which is to start with the crossing, uh, start with the crossing equation um, uh, um, in the following form. So you can think of the crossing symmetry equation as being um, uh, a statement that space-like separated operators can use. So we're going to take x1 and x3 to be space-like from each other. And if we do, then their commutator, can be, uh, their commutator is 0. So this is x1, 3, space-like. Sorry, question? Yeah. The, the reason why you started from the disk is, is that it will make positivity of the sum more likely, what you said you were saying. Uh, no, D disk doesn't make positivity more likely. So it's true that D disk is positive, but we're going to have functionals that are integrals of D disk against something, and that something might be negative. Um, so why so are we starting from this? We're starting from D disk to get the double zeros. The double zero. So the double zeros we're going to build in, positivity will check later. Is it obvious that, uh, that if you, yeah, I also have the same question. So somehow you are assuming that if we aim for the disk, then this is good because, because of the sine square factor? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. The D disk gets the sine square factor, correct. That's, that's all it does. So, okay, so the functional we'll write down, like all functionals, and the bootstrap is, is um, the, the sum rule that we'll get is a consequence of crossing symmetry. One way to think about crossing symmetry is in terms of this statement. So what does this mean? Well, this, this uh, we can write down the two different orderings here. Um, so we have 5x4, 5x3, 5x1, 5x2, for example. And in this ordering, we can do the OP between 1 and 2, um, because this product of operators acts on the right vacuum. Um, and we can do the OP between 3 and 4, because this product acts on the left vacuum. Okay, so it's natural to expand this in terms of the F's channel OP. For the other ordering where we swap 1 and 3, it's natural to expand that in terms of the T channel OP. Um, and so this is, uh, if you do the OP expansion, you get an equality of, between the S channel and the T channel OP expansion. So this is just a way of writing the crossing equation. Um, and then what we'd like to do is take a double null integral of this equation over x1 and x3, um, and that will get, give us a statement of crossing symmetry in terms of the d-disc. Okay, so let me, write, let me, let me draw a picture. So uh, we're going to pick some null plane, and we have 2 and 4 not on the null plane and 1 and 3 will be integrated along the null plane on parallel null lines. Um, so so let, let's see how this works. So, so this, the sum rule that we're going for is 0 is equal to a double null integral of this um, statement of crossing symmetry. <coughs> in this causal configuration. Um, okay, so, so, so let's check that we indeed get the d-disc. So the idea is that uh, we break this into two terms. So, so we have a double null integral. Sorry, David. Uh, yeah. If you integrate over 1 and 3, then at some point they are not space-like separate. Ah, so that's not true. So if they're on parallel null planes, this is an important fact. Um, they're always space-like from each other, uh, everywhere along this uh, along this line. 
And, and in fact, you can check, you can compute the, the interval, the, spa the, the, the interval between them, it's actually constant. Um, it has to do with the fact that the, this, this separation is, this transverse separation is orthogonal to the direction that they're being integrated along, which is also known. So, yeah, thank you for that. That's an important point. So this is, this is sort of like, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's using these null integrals, but it's sort of the only context where you can use the null integrals and keep the points space like from each other. If you do anything, if you move them slightly off the null plane, then, then you ruin this. Aren't you throwing out a lot of information? Because before you knew that this thing was just vanishing pointwise, and now you say that integral it vanishes. Yeah, good, good, good. So there's a question mark here. Maybe I should have made that bigger. So the sum rule that we get is going to have problems. And we're going to have to fix the problems. And when we fix the problems, we'll end up with something valid. The price that we'll pay is that it will not actually just depend on the d-disk. It's going to have some extra contributions. Well, I'm not worried about whether what you get is going to be correct or not. I'm just worried that you seem to be, when you replace... Oh, throwing out information. Yeah, you're throwing out information. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Um, yeah, good. So, so um, first of all, so, right. So this is, this is, so the sum rules that we'll arrive at will not just be null integrals, unweighted null integrals. We're, we're going to end up weighting these integrals in a particular way. Okay. Um, there's, there's a question of, of how sophisticated those weightings are and how much information they, they throw out. That, that's an interesting question. Maybe we can talk about that later when I describe the construction. Okay. Um, okay. So we're just focusing on one of the orderings here um, for one and three. So this is one of the terms, and then we have minus another term where we swap one and three. Okay. Um, now, by this discussion over here, we know that these null integrals give commutators. The null integral of phi 1 kills this vacuum, so we can replace this with a commutator. Again, with questions about the convergence of the integral. Um, and the null integral of phi 3 kills this vacuum, so we can replace this with a commutator as well. And this is the S channel D disk. So we ended up with a statement that the integral of the S channel D disk is equal to the integral of the T channel D disk. Okay? And that has the basic structure that we want. Um, now there's a question mark here because there are some, there's a problem with this sum rule, okay? And we'll see the problem in a little bit. Hmm. Let's see, I'm already. How am I doing on time? I think you have 15 minutes, but I'm not sure. Is it yeah. one hour or an hour and 15? It's yeah. one hour, but we have uh, time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, okay. All right. So, so, so this is this is the basic this is the basic structure, um, but um, uh, but the sum rule has problems. So let me say what the problems are. So the first problem is that um, the endpoints of the integral are not sufficiently well behaved in this case. We'll see that explicitly in a moment. Um, the other problem is that this sum rule is actually identically zero um, uh, for for a kind of silly reason. Um, if you about if you plug in the conformal block expansion um, in this term, the S channel block expansion for this term, and the T channel block expansion for this term. They're actually just identical expressions. Okay, so we we proved well. We we've incorrectly proved a correct statement. Zero. <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to have to fix all. We're going to have to fix both of these problems. And um, I, I think for, for understanding this, um, it, it's useful to now finally go to cross ratio space. Okay, so now we'll write down the integral that, that, that uh, Slava was asking for at the beginning. Um, and I think in the interest, well, okay, yeah. Um, okay, very good. So, so, uh, um, okay, so, so how do we go to cross ratio space? So. I, at least for me, conceptually, it's useful to think about this in, in two steps. So the, the first step is to generalize this uh, th this configuration to to um, to make the conformal transformation properties manifest. Um, and the idea the idea for that is to think about these null integrals in terms of in terms of the, the light transform. So um, let me just write the definition of the light transform in the embedding space. 
So the idea is that if you have an operator with some spin, uh, spin j in the embedding space, the light transform um, is a null integral of this operator that takes the following form. Okay, capital X and capital Z are the usual embedding coordinates. X encodes the position, and Z is the spin polarization vector. Um, and um, so this definition makes clear that the, the light transform is conformally invariant because um, X and Z just transform linearly under the conformal group. Um, and um, it, it also makes clear that uh, L takes an operator with dimension delta and j to some formal thing that transforms with um, dimension 1 minus j and spin 1 minus delta. So where does that come from? Well, in the embedding space, the dimension is the homogeneity minus the homogeneity in x, and the spin is the homogeneity in z. So you have to compute the homogeneity in x and z of this expression, using the fact that O itself is homogeneous in both its arguments. And if you do that, you'll get these homogeneities. Okay? So this immediately gives us something that uh, it's a conformally invariant integral transform, and it changes the quantum numbers in this way. Um, and now we can recognize these null integrals that we have over here as examples of the, of the light transform. So how do you do that? Well, so if we define um, this, so in embedding coordinates, usually people write x plus capital X minus, and then x mu. And then for x mu, I'm also going to choose light cone coordinates, and I think I'm, I think I may have, let's see, um, uh, x plus, x minus, little x, here. Okay? So, um, in these, in this parameterization, we can define x naught as the following, minus 0, comma, 0, comma, 1 half, comma, 1 half, comma, 0. This is a point at, um, at scry minus. I don't know how to draw scry. Uh, <laughs> Scry. <laughs> um, and um, Z naught is, uh, we, we'll choose the following point. Okay, so you, you should check, you have to check that um, uh, that X naught squared and Z naught squared are zero, and X naught that Z naught is zero. Okay, that's what you have to check in order for these to be valid embedding space coordinates. Um, if you make these choices and plug them in here, um, then you get precisely, so the statement is that L of O, X naught, Z naught, is exactly the null integral that we have over X plus. Minus infinity to infinity, DX plus O plus 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 of X minus equals zero, X plus, and then some transverse position X. Okay? So, um, so what this means, is that we can interpret uh, these null integrals as light transforms. And once we've done that, now we know how the whole thing transforms under conformal transformations, because the light transforms transform like primaries. Um, and so that lets us switch to whatever conformal frame we want. So I apologize for going quickly over that part. Um, I apologize for going quickly over everything. Um, please ask me questions afterwards. Why, why do you need to do this? So, uh, yeah, this is a fancy way. Why can't you just plug in the value of the corporate function in terms of g and then... Yeah, you absolutely can. And the reason, the reason that I want to do this is because I first want to switch to a different conformal frame and then go to cross ratio space. The reason is that the cross ratios will be much simpler in the conformal frame than I'm going to choose. Okay, so let me, let me write the conformal frame. So, so, so what I'm going to do now is, is, is choose a different conformal frame for this configuration where we're going to put the null integrals at scribe plus. So the null integrals are going to go along future null infinity. So they're going to look like this. They're going to go along two light rays that uh, both travel along future null infinity. And then we're going to set x4 equal to... So once we've done that, once we put uh, 1 and 3 at future null infinity, we can now use translations rotations and, um, and, uh, and dilatations to move the other points where, uh, where we'd like to put them. 
So we're going to put 1 and 3 along future null infinity, x4 at the origin, and I'm going to pick x2 to be um, at a unit vector in the time direction. Okay, so um, our sum rule now looks like 0 is equal to, uh, in this notation, um, phi of 0, L of phi. Um, the starting point, the, the first argument of the light transform is, is where, uh, where it starts from, and that's actually the point at spatial infinity. So this Penrose diagram is kind of crappy because this whole circle here is the point at spatial infinity. So this is spatial infinity. And then um, the idea is that um, these, uh, the difference between these two contours is encoded in a different choice of, of polarization vector um, that they're being integrated along. So the first thing I want to do is move to this conformal frame, because it's simpler to think about a lot of things in this conformal frame. And then finally, we're going to go to cross ratio space. Could you make the sort of argument in this frame to begin with? Absolutely. Yeah, could have just started in this frame. But this is maybe a more familiar picture to most people. Can I just ask you a stupid thing? So is it really delta to 1 minus j and j to 1 minus delta? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, good. Um, okay, so, so we have these two, we have these two light transforms, and there's a parameter alpha 1 for the first one, and alpha 3 for the other one. Um, and uh, something you, that you can check if you, if you figure out uh, where the locations of the operators are in the embedding space in this picture, I'll just write them down. This is something that you can try to work out yourself. So x1 is at minus alpha 1 comma z1. This is in the x plus x minus x mu coordinates. Um, x2 is 1 e squared e minus e squared e. Um, x3 is at 0 minus alpha 3 z3. And x4 is at 1 0 0. OK? And so uh, when we do this and we evaluate this, we end up with some kind of integral of g. And let me, if, let me compute the integral for just one of the orderings. So I'm going to write the sum rule in the form where we have one ordering minus the other ordering. So this is minus swapping 1 and 3. Um, and, um, okay, and so now we can finally plug in the four-point function as a function of, of uh, cross ratios and get an integral over cross ratios. Um, and so what we have is an integral. OK, I'm actually not quite ready to do that. Let me just plug in. Um, OK, sorry. We have an integral d alpha 1, d alpha 3, minus infinity to infinity of g of u prime v prime, where g depends on the cross ratios. Um, and the cross ratios. Um, are as follows. So u prime is alpha 3 times 2 minus alpha 1 over z13. u prime is um, alpha 1, 2 minus alpha 3 over z13. And z13 is um, minus 2 z1 dot z3. And z1 and z3 are null vectors, so um, uh, another way of writing this is uh, 2 minus 2 n1 dot n2, where these encode the, the, those are the spatial parts of the null vectors. Okay? So we end up with, um, we, we end up with an integral with this funny parameterization of the cross ratios, um, and a particular contour prescription that comes from this ordering of the operators. Um, and uh, if we like, we can change variables to the cross ratios themselves. And when we do that, we get um, 
we get the following uh, expression. Okay? So this integral over alpha 1 and alpha 3 then becomes a cross ratio integral dw dw bar w minus w bar of g of u prime v prime where I'll write u, u prime is w w bar and v prime is 1 minus w 1 minus w bar. So w is w and w bar are the same as z and z bar, except I'm using primes to indicate primes and w's to indicate the variables that are being integrated over, because we we'll have other cross ratios that are not being integrated over. Okay. So we have we have g, and then divided by some crazy square root factor. And here. V is um, 4 over Z13. Okay, so we ended up with a kind of funny integral over cross ratios with this funny square root and a very particular contour prescription that I haven't written down yet that we need to track through from this construction. Okay, and this integral has some, uh, well, okay, let me, write, let me write the contour prescription. So you are more or less out of time. I'm almost out of time. Okay, yeah, let, let me... No, out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sir, okay. uh, none, yeah, we are past the time, yeah. We're past the time, okay. Yes, so if it's a long explanation, maybe we should do it next time. If it's mm -hmm. the second, of course. Okay, <laughs> I'll just say in words and then I'll try to, uh, yeah, and, and then I'll stop. So, and then I'll, I'll give it in more detail next time. So the idea is that this integral inherits a contour prescription from, from this expression. And this expression has been constructed so that we know it can be written in terms of the Um, uh, in, in, this, in this integral, it is not, it's not totally obvious that it can be written in terms of the d-disk. One thing that, and, and I'll show the, so, so you, can, you can apply a contour deformation for this, to this, and there's some nice sort of intricate cancellations that happen that ensure that it's equal to the d-disk. Or you can do the contrary deformation in these variables, and then it's clear that you get something that depends on the d-disk. Okay? Um, but that's all fine. This is, this is the kind of structure that we end up with, and this is the basic structure that we'll be playing with um, for, for the rest of the lecture. So the idea is that this thing has the d-disk built into it. It has other properties that are bad that we're going to have to fix. Um, and once we fix them, we'll end up with a with our first dispersive sum. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll stop. There. Perfect. Thank you. So we have time for a few quick questions, and then just a dumb question. But there's there's a difference, right? This should be this minus the same thing, but with v prime u prime. Uh, yeah, it? yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So we we're going to want to subtract. In the first equation as well, right? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yes? So I, I have a question because it, it looked like in the derivation that the subtlety have to do with the integrals you were doing, um, specifically the, 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 the null integral. But, but it seems to me that there is also a different perspective is that everything can be made rigorous in Minkowski space-time, using the Whiteman axioms uh, in terms of operators, but then the, 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 where you get into subtleties is when you want to go to, to cross-ratio space, because you cannot pick uh, a conformal frame that, I mean, in, in, in Minkowski, right? You need to go to, to the Lorentzian cylinder in some sense. Does this make sense? Uh, I, mean, no, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I think um, the the cross ratio picture and the position space pictures are completely identical at this point. There's yeah. different ways of writing the same thing. And you do have to worry about whether the integrals converge. And one way to think about that is in terms of cross ratio space, or you can think about it in terms of position space. And in either way, you'll, you'll be led to the same analysis. We know much more about the four-point function than just the white and max. No, that, that, that's true. It's true. But, but the first, yeah, but the. Basically, all, all of the derivation up to, to this last part when you go to, to um, cross ratio space, I think can be made rigorous in, in, in terms of the white man action, essentially. You're not using anything special uh, up to the point where you, you pick a conformal frame. 
Yeah. Well, they use the special the charges. Yeah. That, that, yeah. I think I agree with both of both of those statements. I, I, I didn't mean, hear what you said. Um, so the, the, yeah, the, the key thing is about whether the integral converges or not. And there right. it would be really helpful to think about conformal field theory, so not just... Yeah, no, exactly. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, we can continue asking questions during the break. Let's okay. thank David.